Right, let's get started. So our first speaker today is Pragati Pradhan, who is visit visiting us from MIT, um, where she just recently started as a postdoc uh, last May. Um, Pragati got her PhD at the University of North Bengal and Milan Research Institute in India. She was also an assistant professor of physics at St. Joseph's College. And then she did a postdoc at Penn State, um, where she developed a lot of software for Akina. Um, her work, um, she's an expert on timing and spectral analysis of neutron stars and binaries and isolated systems. Um, and now that she's at MIT, she's also started working on stellar wind diagnostics, both of massive stars and full stars. So today she's going to be telling us about supergiant best X-ray transients versus more classical HMSPs. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, and um, thank you for having me over. Uh, so today, I'll be um, explaining, well, let's say, comparing and contrasting the differences between two class of systems. Uh, the first one is the supergiant fast X-ray transients, and uh, I'll compare them against the classical supergiant X-ray binaries. So I'll explain these terms as I go along. But uh, whenever during the talk, if I use the term transients, I will actually be meaning uh, the SFXTs, the supergiant fast X-ray transients. And when I say persistent, I will mostly be meaning the, or I'll rather be meaning the classical supergiant X-ray binary systems. So I'll first start by introducing what a supergiant, classical supergiant X-ray binary system is. And of course, um, feel free to really interrupt me throughout the, uh, during the talk. If there's something that I'm not clear, please feel free to interrupt me if you have urgent questions. So um, a supergiant X-ray binary is a binary system in which one of them is, the, is a bigger companion star. It's mostly an O star or a B star, which has around uh, 10 solar mass. Typically, uh, the mass is huge. They're very massive. And it is in binary system with a compact object. The compact object in which I'm talking about today is mostly a neutron star, and they are orbiting across each other. And uh, SFXTs, why SFXTs, why we, uh, why we need to make a comparison between SFXTs or the transients versus the persistent systems is because of the following. So these are the similarities between these, tra these kind of transient systems versus the persistent systems. Firstly, uh, they have both of these systems the SFXTs and the supergiant X-ray binaries, they have similar um, supergiant companions. It's a similar OB star. And also they have the orbital period or the orbit, uh, the period with which uh, one of them orbit uh, around the other is, uh, they are similar for both of these systems. They also have similar X-ray spectrum. That means if you uh, look at the X-ray spectra, it's um, not often possible to identify them. Uh, they are not very different. And uh, the third one is that the, uh, so when you, when you want to identify that <coughs> the compact object is a neutron star, two sure shot ways to identify them is, firstly, so you look at the pulsation characteristics. If you have pulsations coming from the compact object, it's definitely a neutron star versus, let's say, a black hole. 
And the other is you look into the cyclotron line, uh, you look into the cyclotron line in the X-ray spectrum. So these are resonance scattering features which are seen as dips in the X-ray spectrum and the beauty of this kind of lines is that you can directly measure the magnetic field of uh, the compact objects. So when you see these two signatures in case of uh, in any uh, uh, in the timing and the spectral analysis you can identify that the compact object is indeed a neutron star. Now this has been the case for all persistent systems. So uh, there has been pulsations detected in most of them, cyclotron line detected in, uh, in um, uh, majority of them. In case of SFXTs or the transients, uh, it's very interesting because there are very, uh, so you have pulsation detected in, more, uh, in some of them. You have uh, so-called cyclotron line detected in some of them, but you sh we should remember that all of these uh, are seen as dips in the X-ray spectrum and there has been a huge debate going on in the community as to whether the cyclotron line feature is real or not. So uh, the pulsation and the cyclotron ca uh, line characteristics in SFXTs or the transients remain debatable. <coughs> Now to visually show you the difference between the persistent system, this is a persistent system Vela X1. You see that the light curve of Vela X1 is, um, so you have, it's persistently accreting, you can make out from the light curves, there are no uh, periods of lull. So you have, um, of course there are, there's a lot of variability depending on, um, let's say the presence of matter and how much it's accreting uh, at that point, but uh, overall you can call this a persistent system. Now the system that I'm talking about, SFXTs, this is an, a transient system and you, if you look at the light curve, you see that it is in question most of the times and then suddenly it flares uh, at around this point, it flares up to a very high value and it typically lasts for hours and then it dies down and goes back to its question state. Now this, this is the characteristic with, which distinguishes the transients, this kind of transient system from the persistent systems and we want to look into the details and that will be the focus of my talk today. I want to discuss the details of what exactly makes this uh, uh, transient system different from this persistent system despite the fact that they have similar uh, supergiant companion, similar orbital period, similar extra spectrum and pulsations in some of them. So um, one, uh, also I should uh, make note of the uh, range of luminosities here. In case of persistent systems, the luminosity varies from uh, 10 to the power 34 to 37, whereas in case of the transient systems, the SFXTs, there is a wide range of, uh, the dynamic range is very high. So you have the equation spectrum where uh, luminosities last from 32 to 30, and uh, in case of flares, which you just saw in the last slide, it goes from 10 to the power 36 up to 10 to the power 30. So they are very luminous and the dynamic range of luminosities for both the systems are also very different. So one, <clears throat> one possible explanation, I'll start with the first one, which was put forward, was to say that, okay, possibly the rise, uh, the fact that there is, um, you know, a transient outburst in case of uh, SFXTs is because simply there is accretion of clump of matter, uh, accretion from a clump of matter in this kind of systems. For example, let's say... Um, you have, uh, uh, you have a lot of stellar wind coming from the companion star and these are inhomogeneous in nature. So when, uh, when a neutron star in this case passes through a clump of matter, you, there's an increased accretion and that is manifested as flares in the light curve. Now this kind of uh, explanation has been uh, uh, put forward to uh, like study the variability of a lot of, this is a persistent system, this is another persistent system, 1657. So you see this is just one snapshot. You see that uh, the upper one, upper panel there is uh, an X size, it's a soft um, energy light curve from 0.3 to 10 keV. The second panel is from 15 to 70 keV and there is a hardness ratio there. So what we did was, uh, uh, if you just look at the light curves behind the panel, you'll see that it is more or less persistent and suddenly at this point it starts flaring. So we wanted to identify uh, what causes this flarings and of course the backdrop here is that this uh, supergiant extra binary here is known for having clumps of matter in its stellar wind. So one way to identify this is to look at their hardness intensity resolved uh, spectral analysis. So we divide this whole light curve into five uh, segments depending on the hardness ratio here. So this is one, uh, this is the case where there is an uh, increase in hardness ratio which means uh, soft X-rays are absorbed. Similar, uh, similar A and C in this case are similar and B and D are similar. Now, um, 
we carried out a spectral analysis for these five segments and what we find is very interesting. So this is what we find and uh, you see that for segment A, the time stamps is same for both. You see that for segment A, when there is an increase in the hardness ratio, it is, um, it is accompanied by an increase in absorption here. So uh, make a note of the uh, units here. It's, a, it's accompanied by an increase in absorption, whereas for segment B, uh, there is the value of the absorption goes down. In segment C, you see that there is a large increase in the uh, absorption parameter here, mm -hmm. and in segment D, it goes down and E, it comes back to A. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the reason, one possible scenario why this kind of uh, variation, uh, you know, the intensity, uh, hardness ratio varies with the absorption is uh, that possibly through uh, when the neutron star was in segment A, it had just started to accrete matter from the, uh, from the companion star. So this, uh, so this is uh, uh, an increase in absorption. Segment B is possibly when it just passed through a clump of matter, uh, but in that, uh, uh, through a stellar wind, but in that case, the matter was a little scanty. Because of the scanty uh, ma matter there, you see that NH is very low, low here. In segment C, it's very interesting because now um, the NH value suddenly goes up to very high value and that can be explained by thinking that the clump, uh, the neutron star actually passed through the clump of matter. So when it passes through the clump of matter, you see an increase in the NH value as well as an, an increase in the equivalent width of the fluorescence lines there in the first two panels. And in, once it passed through the clump of matter in segment D, so there is an increased accretion and of course, when there's an increased accretion, there will be an increase in X-rays, and that is exactly what you see in the light curves after, uh, uh, at segments D and E. So this analysis here shows uh, direct evidence that clump events are present in the system, in the supergiant X-ray binary, uh, or the persistent system, and um, such kind of simil an similar analysis has also been carried out for other kinds of, uh, trans uh, for SFXs or the transients. And this is another, this is uh, the case of a supergiant fast X-ray transient. Here you see that there is uh, the similar variability like I showed uh, previously. And here the authors have also carried out similar kind of analysis. You see here, uh, so this, the lowermost panel here is the flux. You see here that the, fl uh, at this point there is an increase in accretion, it's just starting to accrete and that's accompanied by an increase in the NH value here. At the peak of the flare, which is this point here, uh, the um, NH value suddenly goes down, but that can be explained by saying that uh, once it has accreted matter, it photoionizes everything around it, so that uh, causes a decrease in the NH value. And then uh, once the accretion has uh, sta started to occur and the uh, clump is now moving away or the neutron star is moving away from the clump, there is a decrease, uh, uh, there is a decrease in the flare here and it is accompanied by uh, so that, that signature there, increasing absorption, that signature there shows that uh, the, the remaining of the clump is being accreted and then it falls down when, where the clump and the neutron star will move away. So this kind of hardness um, uh, intensity resolved uh, spectral analysis has been carried out to look at s signatures of clump events in case of persistent systems as well as transient systems. Now um, that is all very good. but. Um, the, uh, the pros and cons about this kind of clump events, the, uh, the problem here is that although clump events will, uh, it allows you to explain, uh, you know, when there is an, uh, when there is an accretion, it causes, there is an increased um, accretion from the clumps and then there is an increase in the X-ray luminosity which is seen in the light curves, but it is not able to explain the, um, the lull in the light curve. Why do, uh, why do they remain in quiescent state most of the times then? So this is one thing that, is, uh, that clump event uh, models are not able to explain. And also, if we dive deeper into the details of how clump events um, are actually formed, what is the typical size of clump, uh, clump winds? What about the stability of clump winds? Are they uh, stable, let's say, in case of um, around the neutron star, which are very strong um, with, uh, with a lot of electromagnetic radiation coming from the neutron star? When these kind of deeper details starts uh, coming into picture, we see that there are a lot of open questions in this kind of uh, simplistic scenario of only the clumpy winds explaining the extra luminosity in case of transients. So, um, in order to overcome this, uh, uh, the, the next approach, the next explanation as to why uh, the SFXT saw such dramatic variability was to combine them, this probably with something else. And that something else was something very intrinsic to the neutron star and that is 
possibly you have an onset of some kind of gating mechanisms. And in this case, uh, when I say gating mechanisms, it means that you have, th there is some way in which uh, accretion is halted onto the neutron star. So you don't allow accretion to t uh, take place onto the neutron star, it halts at some point. And then when this, when this condition is removed, suddenly there is an accretion onto the neutron star and then you see an increase in the X-ray luminosity. So this kind of, this model kind of explains uh, the, uh, the, uh, the dim, the quiescent state of the transients as well as the flaring stages. Um, in order to delve deeper into the getting mechanisms, I saw one picture here of direct accretion regime. So here this is what happens in case of direct accretion. You have stellar winds coming in from the uh, companion star and so, so basically whether or not accretion happens it is an interplay of three radii, at least in this kind of systems. You have the accretion radius where the matter from the companion star starts to gravitationally focus onto the neutron star there. You have the co-rotation radius which is the um, radius at which the, um, the neutron star uh, angular velocity is equal, equal to the local Keplerian velocity and the magnetospheric radius and this is very important for the uh, point that I am trying to make here is the magnetospheric radius in which the, uh, in which the magnetic pressure balances the ram pressure of the infalling matter. So this, in case of direct accretion, you can see that this is a uh, this is a good case because you have uh, you have gravitational focusing being carried on here, and then once it focuses, it uh, it will allow direct accretion to take place onto the neutron star. But in case of gating mechanisms, uh, like I specifically talk about magnetic gating here, this is the scenario in case of gating mechanisms. I've just picked two random. There are many, and you can refer to this paper here for detailed uh, scenarios. But for this scenario that I'm trying to explain, we see that magnetic gating. So basically, mag uh, so because of the magnetic field, there is an opening and closing of gates, and thereby opening and closing of accretion, which is happening onto the neutron star. Now, in order for this to happen, this should be one of the conditions when uh, if uh, the neutron star is supposed to gate uh, close the gates for accretion to occur which is the magnetospheric radius you see here should be larger than the uh, than the accretion radius now remember that accretion radius is the radius where it starts to uh, gravitational focus onto the new uh, onto the neutron star and thereby allow accretion so uh, when this is very larger compared to the uh, accretion radius here, there is no gravitational focusing of the matter which comes from the neutron star and therefore it disperses. It doesn't really focus on to the neutron star. But for this kind of situations, that is the magnetic, for magnetic gating to occur, the magnetic field of this kind uh, of, uh, this kind of compact object here should be very large. So that is one, um, a drawback of this kind of um, th this explanation here is that the mag uh, so and also remember that this core rotation radius is a proxy for the uh, the spin period of the neutron star so it has to be a, it has to be an interplay of the magnetospheric radius as well as the uh, pulse period to uh, allow this kind of uh, gating mechanisms to occur and um, so it necessitates very long spin periods and as you can see the magnetospheric radius has to be extended. So that actually means that you need very large values of uh, magnetor like magnetic fields for this kind of neutron stars. But again like I mentioned earlier in the uh, beginning of this uh, talk here that there are few cases albeit um, uh, um, debatable that you have periods detected for this kind of systems and also there are cyclotron lines detected for this kind of systems. Now these two kind of observational characteristics goes against the very theory of uh, the, uh, the quiescent spectrum in case of SFXTs caused because of magnetic gating. Now um, the the challenge behind studying SFX is, is, as you can already see, is that we don't know when it is it, when it is going to flare. So it becomes observational; it becomes difficult to constrain uh, these kind of different parameters, unless you, of course, directly monitoring, you know, monitor it, which people are doing. One other way to do, to get to understand this kind of uh, gating mechanisms is to look for, for intermediary states, uh, intermediary sources. So let's say. Um, I give an example of this source here. This is a persistent uh, pulsar, and it's a very super slow pulsar. Remember that the uh, the uh, onset of magnetic gating required two uh, two uh, um, two things to uh, occur. One should have been that the spin period should have been very large, and the magnetic field should be very large. Now, this pulsar here is a super slow pulsar. It has a pulsation characteristic uh, pulsation period of ten thousand seconds, and um, 
there are theories which say that this is indeed a, um, this was indeed born as a accret uh, accreting magnetar because right now at the accretor phase it is spinning at this long spin period. Uh, so we can study this kind of uh, this this kind of uh, sources in details to look at the uh, magnetic and there are very few of them. Uh, so you can uh, look at these kind of uh, super slow pulses and study the magnetic gating characteristic in details. And uh, the catch here is that there is also a lot of debate r lying around the cyclotron line for this kind this source. So uh, there is a debatable cyclotron line at around 28 keV. Now this, why is the cyclotron line important is because when we are talking indeed about the magnetic gating, if we detect cyclotron line within let's say 70 keV range, then it fall, it puts the uh, magnetic field of the in the order of 10 to the power 12 Gauss, which is not at all magnetar. So it becomes very, very uh, essential to identify whether or not the cyclotron line is indeed present in this kind of systems, whether there is magnetic gating happening or not. And this one observational constraint, so this is the uh, light curve for the same source where I have put on this uh, bar, uh, separated them by their spin period. You see that they actually pulse at 10,000 seconds. It's, you can see it in the light curve itself. Uh, so um, coming back to cyclotron line, to identify whether this kind of sources, uh, this source uh, indeed um, has the cyclotron line present or not. Uh, so there has been many observations of this source earlier, but all of them, uh, they are marked by red there. That was the integral observations, the Peposax and the Suzaku observations. All of them are, carry, uh, are carried on at, uh, except integral, but then there you don't have very, um, have to stack in different spectra and uh, cyclotron line is very sensitive to uh, the signal to noise ratio. So you should have some, uh, some instrument which is, um, which, which will allow you to uh, identify the cyclotron lines in this bright phase of uh, in this bright phase of the pulsar, and uh, this is a Suzaku spectrum of the same source. There is a debatable cyclotron line there which we don't really identify. But the good thing about uh, this source is that we have a new star observation scheduled coming up in uh, this cycle. So probably we'll be able to at least put this into rest whether or not there is indeed a presence of a cyclotron line here, and then study the magnetic gating uh, mechanisms in more detail. Now the third explanation here is uh, mm, something called the quasi-settling regime, quasi-spherical settling regime. Here the idea is something like this, that you have uh, ma uh, mag matter coming in from the uh, companion star and then it holds onto the uh, uh, surface of the neutron star and then it forms layers and then there is no sufficient cooling so it holds accretion most of the times and suddenly when there is let us say change in the extra luminosity, it allows all accretion to take place. But the problem with this kind of uh, explanation again is that it does not explain such dramatic variability in case of SFXTs. Now finally I come back to our work here. So this prompted us to actually look at all the, um, uh, we carried out spectral analysis of all the SFXT systems and all these uh, persistent systems together uh, uh, using the XMM and Suzaku data. And these are two, uh, for um, comparison here I showed two different um, systems here, this is the persistent system and this is the transient system. Now they have similar orbital periods, everything is similar, but you look at their X-ray spectrum and note that uh, this starts from 3 kV here. So 3 kV here should be somewhere here. So if you look at the shape of the spectra, uh, X-ray spectrum from 3 to let's say 10 kV, you see that there is a uh, there is an absorption, there is a high absorption in case of Vela X1 here compared to uh, the relatively less absorption in case of supergen fast X-ray transients here. So we, we carried out similar analysis for all kind of uh, all um, supergen systems and the um, trans, uh, persistent systems and this is what we find. So all the colorful uh, on the uh, on this side, all the colorful ones are the persistent systems and all the uh, black ones here are actually the supergen fast X-ray transient systems. You see that there is relatively less absorption uh, in, uh, so this NH value re relatively less absorption as well as the equivalent with is very small in case of this kind of systems and this is a possible signature that in case of the transient systems, the, the winds in case of transient systems are possibly stronger than uh, supergen systems because a stronger wind means that it allows less absorption to actually take place. So this is our explanation for um, the difference in behavior between these kind of persistent systems and the transient systems and there has been analysis by other authors as well. So they can, uh, they, uh, this is just an example of two similar kind of systems, persistent versus transient and you see that 
most of the times the persistent system seems to be in the, uh, this has a lot of input to it the uh, luminosity the orbi uh, orbital period and you see that uh, velx1 remains in di direct accretion regime most of the times whereas in case of and also note that their uh, wind velocities is comparative lower compared to this system which is a transient so the explanation is that uh, most of the times it is in this uh, in the supersonic propeller regime and then suddenly when there changes in the ma mass accretion rate or the wind it comes down to the direct accretion rate and that probably explains why uh, there is a, um, a high luminosity at that point so uh, i I kind of end my talk here. So these are, this is just a summary slide which shows uh, that I have, exp I have actually talked about different possible scenarios why, uh, for the transient behavior. We have the clumpy wind, the gating, quasi-spherical setting, and the, uh, the one that we propose is probably there's a difference in the wind velocity. And it will be very interesting to look at this kind of systems, also the companion stars of this kind of systems, and optically monitor it so that we understand the difference. And there are, of course, other uh, explanations as well, which I don't talk about, and I end my talk here. Thank you. It's 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 seen in almost all the uh, well the way uh, this follows is that the origin of clumpy winds, it's supposed to start from a slight instability. Like when you have um, 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 stellar winds coming in from the companion star, even a slight amount of instability somewhere in between will give rise to uh, hydrodynamical instabilities and that will cause rise, uh, cause rise to clump, give rise to clumps. And that has been seen for most of the, even for isolated stars, you see that these kind of clumps are actually present in and around. So basically it's, it starts at instability somewhere and then that propagates forward. Um, okay. This guy here? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this was done with Suzaku. So Suzaku has, um, so what we thought, we had to kind of look, uh, divide this into five segments, firstly based on the hardness ratio and also based on how much of uh, um, statistics you have in this, uh, in this, um, like in each segment in order to carry out any meaningful investigation. So we, uh, for our motivation of doing this was we looked at the hardness ratio because hardness ratio in this case is divided by, uh, is defined by H by S. So uh, if there's an increase in the soft photons, there's an increase in the hardness ratio here. Uh, there's an increase in the hardness ratio here. So, because the S, uh, the soft component decreases. Now, uh, we extracted the spectra similarly here, and then we made, uh, this is a plot which shows the uh, NH absorption for different segments of that, li uh, of that light curve there. Now, you see here that when there is an, uh, when there is an uh, increase in the hardness ratio, there is a decrease in the soft X-ray photons. They are all being absorbed, basically. And the way to measure absorption is to look at the NH variation here. So this is from, this goes up to um, 17 to 10 to the power 22. Uh, so that is, the, uh, uh, that is the unit here. And then you see that there is a larger uh, increase in the absorption value here, which is at, uh, it agrees with that uh, change in the hardness ratio here. Similarly for this, you see that the hardness ratio doesn't change much. And this is because in this case, the neutron star was passing through a scanty matter. So there's less, there's nothing for, and there's nothing to absorb the X-rays coming from the neutron star. And because there is less absorption here, the absorption value also goes down. And in this case here, which is segment C, uh, you see that there's an increase in the absorption, which means it is just passing through the clump of matter. And why do I say through? It's not passing through the clump of matter here, because here uh, the increase in the NH value is accompanied by an increase in the uh, uh, fluorescence strength of the iron line there. So that means what happens is you have X-rays coming from the neutron star and when it passes through a clump is where the fluorescence takes place. And when this uh, um, uh, line fluorescence takes place, there's an increase in the uh, line intensity here, which you see here. So this region is, it is actually passing through the clump of matter. And once what happens when you've, uh, when it has taken in a lot of matter, that means there's a lot of accretion happening place. So when it comes out of the uh, clump here, it has all the uh, additional 
uh, matter that it has already accreted. So it has to somehow show as the uh, uh, as you know increase in the X-ray luminosity, which is being shown there in the first two panels. You suddenly see that at segment after segment C, there's an increase in the uh, flaring of the light curve, and that's because of the matter that it has already accreted through this segment C. So the, uh, so this is the basic principle behind how you carry this kind of um, hardness ratio resolve analysis. So you look at their NH variation, you look at the light curves, and then you look at their equivalent width and kind of paint a picture of what must have been going on. I can talk to you in more details. <laughs> I just have one last question. So the, the last um, idea that you mentioned about the velocities of the winds, mm -hmm. um, when you're doing that analysis looking at the uh, NH and the equivalent width, do you find that in the SFXTs is that Uh -huh, that's a very good question. So for this, what we did was, for uh, the, the work that I presented here, what we did was we just averaged out everything. So we, uh, uh, and most of them were, um, uh, were like behaving typically. So they were, they were quiescent at some point and then they were flaring at some point. So we just took the entire segment and then we carried them together. But uh, in order to get a comprehensive behavior, uh, you know, a comprehensive comprehensive idea of what is the NH value, but there have been works and we also, uh, like, you know, look into individual systems and then look at their, like these kind of things. We look into details of how they are varying and uh, do it also. But for the work that I presented here, it was a comprehensive one. Right. Sure. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you for that introduction, that detailed intro introduction. Um, okay, uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. I'm going to give a different type of talk today, uh, really oriented on simulations and coming from a different perspective of uh, UV astronomy, uh, which I have done a lot of work on trying to explain uh, theoretically. So this is my outline, and I will try to get through everything here. Um, and I'll go briefly through UV observations, which I think people understand here probably, but just to remind, um, you have a quasar in the background and a coincidental foreground uh, halo that has been chosen to probe the gas, the circumgalactic medium around that foreground galaxy. And so you look at these galaxy uh, quasar pairs and with COS, Cosmic Origin Spectrograph, you can get a survey, and this is the COS halo survey a slide that we all share in that collaboration, and it's very old now, almost 10 years old, um, of about you know, uh, a few dozen um, pairs probing the circumgalactic medium out to 150, uh, 160 kiloparsecs. And you can compile statistics from that. And here we show um, uh, kind of the, uh, a CGM observable, the oxygen six column density, uh, versus specific star formation rate. And you can see there's, there's bimodality in specific star formation rate and galaxy properties uh, is reproduced in the CGM. And that's an interesting thing to try to explain. So to help with that are cosmological simulations. And these days, I work a lot on the EAGLE project. Um, and that's a, you know, one of these massive simulations, much, much like illustrious TNG. And I will talk about both today. In fact, I'm going to try to talk about all of these simulations a little bit in this short amount of time. Um, in, in my three cases of motivating X-ray observations to distinguish models, I'll take something from, uh, that I've worked on in the, and others and my collaborators in the Eagle Project and contrast it to one of these uh, other simulations in kind of an agnostic sense, not saying that one is more right than the other, that we need to test uh, them, uh, these models, and that 
uh, things that produce similar UV observations can be distinguished in the X-ray. Um, just uh, kind of an advertisement of some of the work that I do. I ran a set of uh, simulations, kind of zoom simulations, called Eagle CGM simulations, where I did uh, integrate this ion by ion non-equilibrium tracking. Um, following, for example, oxygen 1 to oxygen 9, among many other different ions and species in these simulations, and you can make uh, movies of oxygen 6. Um, and I won't talk about that, you know, that individual ion tracking as much today, but, you know, something that is kind of cool that we, we can do is I can put in, like, a flickering AGN uh, of different types and show uh, non-equilibrium effects of enhancing oxygen 6 and make mock spectra for the UV. So that's sort of separate. That's like kind of my bread and butter of what I do. But um, going on to the x-rays and why I have become an x-ray astronomer um, or am progressing in that direction is uh, some of these observations in the UV is a, a big you know, part of this nature paper. Jason Tumlinson in 2011 pub that we published showed an impressive amount of oxygen-6 around um, star-forming galaxies. So if you think every star-forming galaxy is sort of like cos halos is the same, which is the best we can do, um, and you know, add a, fit a radial profile to that, you can integrate the mass out to 160 kiloparsecs in oxygen-6, and it's significant. You know, it's a couple million. Um, and what I did was run simulations, and every time I look at oxygen 6 in those simulations, um, I'm looking, I'm doing the ion by ion tracking and, you know, following the stellar evolution, all these, you know, everything in these models. Um, and oxygen 6 would always be this kind of small sliver, these, these green slivers here, and there would be much more metals in other, in, in, of the oxygen budget, which is about half of metals, um, in other species, like oxygen 7 is pretty commonly seen as is dominant almost always uh, in the cyan and the and blue is oxygen eight and those are x-ray ions um, and others people uh, Nicole Sanchez uh, I worked a little bit with her and I was not on this paper but she used uh, Michael Tremel's um, Romulus 25 simulation to look you know compile these statistics and in fact she might find more oxygen seven it's a suggesting uh, you really need to do to get a full census of metals Either you need to build links, uh, which would be great. That's something that I'll talk about throughout today, or um, maybe something like Arcus. Um, and some interesting physics behind this is, as you go up in halo mass, I'll show a lot of things today as a function of M200 of central galaxies and uh, occupying a halo mass of 10 to the 12, like Milky Way mass, or 10 to the 13, like a, a luminous red galaxy uh, halo. Um, and the oxygen content in a cylinder goes up. The average column density goes up, and that's a theoretical quantity. You can't measure that directly. But oxygen-6 is uh, what we try to fit um, and look at and fit the absorption profiles. And there's a peak here where oxygen-6 has that collisionally ionization band and that very specific 10 to the 5.5 Kelvin range. And then it goes down as these halos become hotter. So if you can get an X-ray telescope and uh, observe like a cos halos like survey with oxygen 7, oxygen 8, um, you'll see a peak at a different halo mass, um, more like oxygen 8, maybe peaking around a luminous red galaxy elliptical type halo. Um, so uh, what we call these, um, uh, this model is kind of uh, the, the uh, virial, thermo uh, virial temperature thermometers um, because each oxygen ion corresponds to a different temperature. Um, so it will be interesting to do a survey with an X-ray telescope to um, not just, you know, find this green sliver around L-star and group galaxies, which goes away in the group galaxies, but to look at oxygen 7, oxygen 8 in sub-L-star galaxies, L-star galaxies, groups, clusters, kind of three orders of magnitude in halo mass. So that's the first case for uh, X-ray uh, observations. Next, I'm going to talk about the pressure of the uh, CGM, and, wow, I am moving fast, so that is great. Um, uh, so this is an observation from Cos Halos uh, by Jess Work, and it will become probably the most cited Cos CGM paper. It's like really, um, you know, it has 
a lot of citations I'm kind of surprised when I saw that. It's about to surpass the Tumlinson et al. Um, paper. Um, and it's using cost halos, but it's actually looking at other ions, um, low ions like carbon-2, silicon-2, things like that, um, more of the cool phase corresponding to 10 to the 4 Kelvin. And uh, through a lot of modeling and work by, that, uh, by people like Jess and uh, that collaboration, um, they are able to take these absorption line systems and fit cloudy model, models to them, usually single phase cloudy models, to the low ions and derive a density assuming an ionization background, et cetera. And the result of that survey is these white points, is the density for the uh, low temperature gas, which if you compare that to a very simple theoretical model, say Maller and Bullock 2004, which, uh, which was done in this paper, um, you expect that densities for the hot phase of the, of the CGM if that uh, halo has all of its baryons. So for uh, the cool phase to be in pressure equilibrium, it will have a density about 200 times higher. And that is a discrepancy of about at least 100 times in densities between observations um, and this theory. So uh, I did some work on this. And you know, there are some you know, factors to that reduce this discrepancy. One is there's a factor of four error that we probably should have released a, an erratum about, but um, uh, we didn't. So uh, more importantly, I'll talk about is using simulations with feedback, super wind feedback, to not just enrich the CGM, but to push baryons out beyond the burial radius and make it less, you know, a flatter profile and more baryons on the outskirts. Um, which these simulations do. It's kind of a generic feature of like Eagle, TN, illustrious, illustrious TNG type simulations um, in order to get the galaxies right. Um, so I kind of redid this and instead of submitting an erratum, we, uh, these guys, uh, Prochaska submitted, you know, republished the data with some new data, some new constraints in H1 columns, et cetera. So they're, they're moved up a little bit and the data, or the, or sorry, the simulations, uh, those Eagle CGM zooms, um, are still, the densities are still too high, I would say, compared to, if you compare like the low ions, the singly ionized species like magnesium to derived uh, densities, physical densities, versus uh, some of these cyan points here. Um, but uh, I think we're closer, so it's not a factor of 100 deviations, it's still a factor of five. And that makes me think, and question about other sources of support that are non-thermal in the in the C, uh, in the CGM. Um, uh, so we think that uh, feedback pushes a lot of baryons out um, and changes the profile, but there could also be other sources of non-thermal support um, beyond the hot halo. And I'll talk about this tomorrow in the ITC luncheon about um, kinematic um, you know, motions, especially rotational motions, any tangential motions that provide support for the halo. And actually, that is integrated into these simulations, that these simulations have those motions. But um, I, swear, I read a nice paper last week, and I think Cho Ching Ji was here probably a couple weeks ago giving a, another seminar uh, where he probably talked about this really nice work of FIRE2 simulations where they put in cosmic ray feedback. Uh, and that is a dramatic change in the CGM between 50 and 200 kiloparsecs. And um, what they have, instead of a hot halo uh, at those distances, um, which is this kind of um, locus, adiabatic locus in the density temperature diagram, uh, you have more of a photoionization equilibrium for most of the photons. And uh, they're able to fit the oxygen-6 with photoionized, uh, photoionized cool gas. Um, but you can see that already, if you look in the x-ray, these will make very different predictions. So I hope uh, that we work to get, you know, that they do that. And um, I think you will see, like, no x-rays around here in these uh, galactic scale halos where you will see more there. But it's hard to detect these because currently in today's epoch with Chandra and XMM, you can't really detect hot halos beyond, you know, maybe the inner 50 kiloparsecs. Uh, 30 kiloparsecs of massive spirals. So detecting uh, these halos around normal galaxies is a critical test of, I would say, galaxy formation altogether, but the balance of feedback and how uh, uh, the CGM is supported if there is a hot halo out there. 
So we need to move and think about links, but also I'll make it the case in the next section for E. rosita, so that maybe we can detect these halos sooner. Um, working with people here, I was motivated, I was excited about you know the the Lynx telescope um, project and um, motivating observations to move you know to complement these UV phases of the CGM with observations of the X-ray halos and the X-ray dynamics going on, not just like seeing the halos, but seeing their dynamics and seeing their motions um, across from like the blue cloud to the red sequence and the green valley. So this is a really nice, um, I don't need that. Um, uh, so um, uh, uh, this is a really nice uh, picture that, uh, oh, thank you, um, that um, my simulations were, you know, made the middle panels, but Grant Tremblay and especially made this, beautified this, and like the Link's final report is, um, uh, you know, fantastically beautiful. So I'm going to move on to something where I'm kind of treading in dangerous waters here. I'm a little bit nervous about this because I'm going to try to present a lot and do a comparison of Eagle simulations and illustrious TNG simulations um, and argue that supermassive black holes clear the CGM in both of these simulations but differently um, and that we can distinguish these models uh, in the very near future. So, um, John Davies was here. He gave a, um, a seminar, one of these seminars, back in November. He was visiting. I mean, he's a, he's a grad, graduate student with Rob Crane at Liverpool John Moore University. He gave a very nice talk here. Um, and so this is the research that he started uh, looking at this correlation between uh, supermassive uh, black hole feedback evacuating CGM. Um, and it's kind of the integrated uh, history of SMBH feedback um, um, pushing out baryons over a Hubble time. So on this side over here, uh, I've taken two Milky Way mass halos, and what I wanted to do was catch this in the act. So using you know a lot of um, data analysis and um, data processing to take the kind of these uh, high cadence snapshot outputs of Eagle um, to find two Milky Way mass uh, halos with similar stellar masses, but very different outcomes, uh, with one on the red sequence, one on the star forming sequence on the left. And the one here I chose because it had a, you know, a pretty dramatic black hole growth phase at about z of 0.8. And in the middle panel here is the fraction of baryons in the CGM. So, uh, you know, the, of the cosmic expectation of baryons. So in a cluster, this value FCGM would, should be called FICM but would be about one in a, you know, a very massive cluster with all of its baryons, mostly in the ICM. But here, uh, in this simulation, the uh, black hole feedback drives out winds and lowers the CGM pretty dramatically within a giga year. Uh, and there's another phase of black hole growth. You can't really see it. The cyan is the, the black hole mass uh, on that scale. Um, so it's like, this is more on the, this side, like a, a Mercury mass, you know, a Sag star, uh, black hole mass, uh, Sag, Sag A star. Uh, and this is about 10 times more massive, or maybe 20 or 30 times more massive, more like 10 to the 7.8. Um, and what I am interested in is, like, as a UV, you know, astronomer, um, you know, while COS is still around in Hubble, is picking a proxy for FCGM, and I argue that carbon-4 is a great proxy, get that covering fraction. So observe sight lines near um, galaxies with known black hole masses, usually like NGCs or Messier objects, um, while we can. And we tried to convince the HST TAC twice of this, and it hasn't, hasn't gone through yet. I think we need to do it, but I'm not just thinking about you know, the UV path. Um, I want to really observe this sequence whether you have a higher mass of a black hole, leading, you know, which is more integrated black hole feedback. Um, this is capable of unbiting much of the CGM, um, reduced accretion, reduced star formation, and more of a quenched appearance of a galaxy or a quenched galaxy. So in this paper, uh, in my paper, I really motivate this uh, ratio as a good predictor of the CGM gas content uh, 
is black hole energy, uh, feedback energy over binding energy. Uh, and the color scale here is, is that ratio. So it's a pretty linear, you know, vertical color scale um, indicating, in, especially like in, these, um, in this Milky Way mass halo regime, um, that uh, you know, most of the CGM is evacuated like we talked about in the last, like I talked about in the last section. Um, most you know, cluster-like things have most of their variants in the CGM uh, or IGRM. Uh, and uh, that we sh you know, should be able to link the black hole uh, to the CGM. Because the black hole energy feedback, which is a prescription put into the simulation, so a thermal prescription in EGLE, um, heating gas to a certain temperature, uh, blowing out winds that can buoyantly rise and leave the halo, uh, should be um, more effective, you know, able to overcome the binding energy uh, more so in galaxies that appear passive. Um, these are central galaxies that I'm talking about, not satellite galaxies. This is not the only simulation to exhibit this behavior. Uh, John Davies has his second paper out last month, and uh, we got the referee report this morning. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think it will make it, you know, um, into acceptance. So that's some good news because it's kind of uh, uh, a little bit of a risky paper. But actually what it is, is trying to show is uh, similarities between these two models that despite these FCGM uh, versus M200 relations being different, you see the same anti-correlation, especially at Milky Way mass halos, uh, especially in uh, Elester's TNG, of anti-correlation between FCGM and the mass of the black hole, which is this coloring is a deviation from the median mass of the black hole at that uh, halo mass. Um, but, you know, we were, in this paper, we were trying to identify similar behaviors uh, but we also want to identify different predictions in the simulations. And that these star forming galaxies in illustrious TNG have a different uh, feedback prescription um, that doesn't really eject uh, baryons from the CGM at early time. So they're pretty rich in baryons. And then uh, uh, Reiner is here, uh, made, uh, Reiner Bar Feinberger. Uh, made the prescription that goes into it. It's, uh, it's a very sophisticated prescription. There's a quasar mode and a kinetic uh, radio mode. And the radio mode um, is pretty strong in these, and it can transform a galaxy in short order from the, the star forming sequence to the passive sequence. So we see that behavior in Eagle. It's actually stronger uh, in Lester's TNG. And I see a way for X rays to, uh, X ray observatories to distinguish these between these two models, and this is where it gets really speculative. And I want to relate this to cos halos and uh, look at cos halos like passive galaxies and compare them to cos halos like star forming galaxies, which uh, we predict, my paper predicts, that these uh, passive like galaxies are more like LRG like halos, 10 to the 13, et cetera. Um, and uh, Dylan Nelson wrote a very nice paper where I think. He, uh, he would argue that the passive halos are lower mass and more evacuated, uh, more directly linked to SMBH feedback, clearing the CGM um, pretty rapidly. So it would be interesting to see Illustrious CG do that high cadence tracking, which, which I did in Eagle. Um, so an experiment I designed, a theoretical experiment I designed, that can happen soon with a real telescope, that's E. Rosita, and it's actually in space now, um, is... And this is the first cut. I was only working with John Zuhome. This is Akosh, uh, Akosh's idea. Um, really, it came through a conversation, is to stack, um, do E. Rosita stacking of normal galaxies in the Z, you know, Z less than 0.05 universe. And um, so as a first cut, I picked galaxies in this box that are star forming, highest quartile star forming, uh, lowest quartile star forming, more massive on average, like cos halos. Um, and what I did was make initial stacks of 250 galaxies of the star forming ones, which I could find in the box pretty easily, and 150 of the passive ones in both boxes and make predictions and make testable predictions that distinguish these models. And this is dangerously preliminary, but uh, in these fields of view, we see that maybe we will see a, you know, an extended halo of hot gas around passive galaxies in those more massive halos in Eagle, 
um, and not so much um, in illustrious TNG. Um, so that is the first attempt at this. Um, it tells a different sequence of SMPH feedback and you know feedback overall affecting the CGM um, and driving variants out in different ways. Um, and both of these simulation suites need this to happen to quench and have a passive uh, red, red and dead passive sequence. So that's why I am here is to make these you know subtract the satellites, which you know I don't know how to do X-ray analysis very well. So that's why I'm here and make it a smooth profile and get some radial profiles that are meaningful and plotted in coordinates that or in units that X-ray astronomers can understand. So on my summary slide, I just want to say that the majority of the universe is hot. Um, the average temperature of a gaseous bearing in a simulation box, you know, no matter what simulation is, probably a, at least a, a million degrees Kelvin, uh, two million degrees Kelvin on that order. The median is at least 10 to the 5 Kelvin. You know, if you talk, think, think back in terms of the warm, hot, intergalactic medium, that's at least 40, 50 percent of, of baryons. Um, so three ways in which X-rays can uh, com complement UV observations, the senses of metals. How much metals are, uh, do stars nucleosynthesize, and do they push most of those metals that they uh, release into the CGM, and that, that's what these uh, simulations predict, that there's more uh, metals in the hot CGM, or in the hot phases of diffuse gas outside of galaxies, than in, actually in the stars, um, that is recycled into stars. Um, are hot halos providing pressure support to the CGM, or are there other contributions? And finally, do hot halos lead to quenched star formation and passive galaxies, more, more of the eagle uh, picture, or it does explosive SMPH feedback clear a halo pretty aggressively and quench a galaxy that way? Or is it like, you know, I think both of those go on in both simulations more so in one than the other. And thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Yes. Uh, why don't you want to try stacking Chandra or XMM or Swiss observation to all of them together? Uh, because they're already available and sitting yeah. in the archive. Um, I'm going to defer that one to Akush. Uh, <laughs> because I think, I think it is possible, but um, I think other people have done this. And, well, ROSAT stacking has been done by Michael Anderson. Um, Chandra stacking, it might be... Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, did you put it back together? It's so old and janky that it's just like, psh, that was a, it's probably a different type of talk. But. Okay. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot. I'd go into the bathroom. So, there we go. Thank you. Just a, a small.